Okay, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, last minute announcements, or last class period announcements, I guess. Um, I sent out an email just this morning. Uh, everybody did their FCEs, so that's great. I'm really excited about that, and I'm looking forward to, in a week and a half, reading them and seeing all the feedback everyone had to share. Um, if you have other feedback that you want to share as well, I'm always happy to hear that. Um, the final exam is tomorrow. Um, I will be around the corner in Wien 5403, or Megan or Amanda will be there um, from basically the whole day from 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. Somebody will be there. Uh, and so you pick a two-hour time window in there. So the latest you can start is 3.30 if you want the full two hours. Um, and if you start at 8, then you'll be done by 10. Uh, and so on. Um, and so, uh, um, and there may be people from my other class taking finals too at the same time, but you know, we can keep it all straight. Uh, I will be in my office today from 2.15 until 4 o'clock, maybe a little before 4, maybe closer to 3.45 that I'll be leaving. Um, so if anyone has any last minute questions and wants to stop by during that time, uh, I'm happy to answer questions there and of course also over email. Um, at the end of class today, I will give you the take home part of the exam. Um, that is, you have two hours to do that um, on your own time. Any, uh, you need to either um, uh, bring it tomorrow, uh, or I guess if you do it quickly, you could bring it this afternoon to my office. Um, but uh, you either need to um, bring it with you and uh, hand it to me or Megan or Amanda um, in the, uh, when you take your exam tomorrow, or um, slide it under the door of my office uh, so that we are sure that it gets to us. Um, if there's nobody in room 5403, don't just leave it on the table there. Um, it might not get to me if we do that. Um, so make sure that you give it to somebody. Um, and since the FCs are done, um, the original deal was that we would just have questions taken from the homework on the final exam, but that seems a little silly because you can just open notes, so you can just bring your, your homework with you. Um, and rather than force you to spend sort of precious time on the final exam recopying things you've already written, um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just take into account in the homework uh, that. So, um, so all of this brain-computer interface stuff and so on, um, if you're done with the homework, then you're all set with that. Um, and then the material to review for the final is the previous um, weeks, um, all the, uh, the excitability um, and neural activity, including Hodgkin and Huxley stuff, um, the, uh, the, the synaptic plasticity, LTP, um, the pre versus post synaptic debate, uh, and then the, um, the vision and language units, and then also the, um, uh, the stuff about information theory and sensory decoding and encoding uh, and all of that. Um, so, it's, uh, so you should, including um, uh, uh, the, the Bayes theorem and how that applied to sensory encoding and decoding. Um, okay, so what questions do people have right now in terms of the final exam, in terms of what you should be doing with your time, um, oh yeah, one other announcement, actually, sorry, before, uh, before I forget. Um, I, I, in addition to the list of topics for the final exam, I also sent out another document that's also posted on Blackboard that has a few sample questions. Um, and those sample questions are mostly related to the research papers. Um, the research papers that you need to know are listed on that document. And I think, Megan, did you post your summary of that also? Yeah, so Megan posted a summary of all of the key points from those research papers. Um, and then what I put up is three different types of questions that you might get about the research papers. Um, and the first type is the one that you're, you might be a couple on the final, but you're sort of least likely to see where it's just a, sort of a factual recall question. So asking you to describe the methods in a paper. So I'll sort of tell you, you know, there was this paper published where they looked at the mean and the coefficient of variation for, um, for uh, long-term potentiation before and after. Um, what did they see? And so you should remember that they saw an increase in mean, because that's what LTP is, and an increase in coefficient of variation. And why do they think that matters? And then because coefficient of variation is um, uh, under, under a certain set of assumptions that they felt were reasonable, um, coefficient of variation is um, um, expected to be equal to this. Um, and if that changes, then either N changed or P changed or they both changed um, and they felt pretty confident at the time that, that it was unlikely that N was changing. 
So that's sort of a factual recall question about a paper, but it asks you to sort of synthesize and describe what goes on, and you might see a couple like that. Um, you might also then see, okay, well, five years later, now we know about silent synapses. How does that throw all this into the air? Um, and, and one way to describe how that sort of, how that sort of forces a reevaluation of this is that now we have a way that in can effectively change. We can have some synapses that are not functional before and they become functional afterwards um, and in is really just a measure of the functional synapses. So that would be one type of question. Um, another type of question is um, asking you to, um, is I tell you a particular um, hypothesis or a particular theory and I ask you to tell me an experiment that you could do to answer that. Um, so for example I could say, you know, just kind of working with this again, um, actually no, I'll do something different. So let's say, um, you, let's say you have the, you have the, the idea that, um, so like we already know that if you do small changes for a barn owl, um, for an adult, then the adult can eventually make a big, big adaptation. If you try and make it do a big adaptation all at once, it won't work. But maybe small, and we already know small changes work. So that's sort of what we already know. That's our baseline knowledge. I might say, okay, well now you have the idea that maybe if you increase dopamine signaling in the brain, then the adult will have a big jump and be able to all at once make a big adjustment. And so how would you test that? Any thoughts about how you would test that? What could you do? So, so the, hypo the hypothesis is if there's more dopamine, the animal will be able to make a jump all at once. So, sure. Inject dopamine. Inject dopamine. Great. Yeah. So take an adult owl, throw some dopamine in its brain, or give it some cocaine or whatever. I mean, you know, <laughs> some, uh, something that increases dopamine signaling. Um, and, uh, and if you do that, then, the, uh, then you would predict then now, um, going from no prism to a 20 degree prism, the animal can make the adjustment. Um, compare it to an animal without dopamine um, of the same age. Put that 20 degree prism on, it doesn't adjust. Um, that would be sort of your experimental setup. Um, so that's another type of question I could ask. Um, and then the third type of question is sort of the reverse of that. It's sort of, a ma I tell you some results and you give me the interpretation. So the second type um, is, I give you a, an interpretation or a theory, you tell me the results that would support it and the experiment. Um, and then the last type, I give you an experiment and some hypothetical results and then you tell me the interpretation. Um, and sometimes these are cases where it's like, Unlike what we saw in class, now you see this. Um, or sometimes it's like a new experiment that is out there and so uh, that, that I just sort of come up with. Um, and so I might say, for example, um, again, maybe not. Uh, so one example would be um, Julie Cower did her experiment with LTP. And in reality, she saw no change in the size of the AMPA response. Um, but you go and do the exact same experiment, exactly the same as her, where you block AMPA receptors and record MDA receptors, and you see that there is a bigger response. Um, and so um, what would the interpretation of that be? What would the interpretation of that be? Did you see a bigger response? So what did, when Julie Cower saw no change, she concluded there's, no, there's not more glutamate out there, and so therefore there's not an increase in release probability. So if we do see a bigger change, what does that mean about the amount of glutamate that's out there? There's more of it. So, um, and so that, that mean, then we would interpret that as there was, there was an increase in presynaptic probability. Um, or I could give you a new experiment that nobody's done yet. And, uh, and, tell you, uh, and tell you what, to, what happens with that. So, you know, uh, and that would be maybe a twist on an existing experiment. So like, for example, um, in the leech, we saw that if you inject, uh, if you control the timing of, um, uh, of spikes, but keep the rate constant, the animal barely changes its motor response. So it seems to be pretty insensitive to timing changes in terms of the way it decodes stimuli. But conversely, if in the leech you change the rate but keep the timing of the first spike constant, the animal definitely notices that. So that's what we saw. So maybe I would say in an earthworm, now you do the same thing in an earthworm, and you control the timing, and when you change the timing in the earthworm, the animal really responds very dramatically to changes in timing. But then when you 
keep the time, the time of that first spike the same and change the rate, the animal doesn't seem to change its behavior very much. So what would that tell you about how the animals, what features the animal's brain is paying attention to when it decodes things? Sure. Yeah, it's paying more attention. Yeah, exactly. So we get the different result. Our interpretation is the sort of opposite interpretation. So those are the sort. Those are those are kind of the, generally speaking the different classes of questions you have. You should at all for all of the papers. You don't need to know all of the details of all the papers. There are a lot of aspects that we skipped over. You're not responsible for those. But the aspects that we talked about are summarized in Megan's document um, and. Uh, and so you should look through those, make sure you understand them, and make sure you're ready to sort of say, okay, well, what if, we, what if the results had come out differently? Or how would I maybe use this same method in a new situation to come up with an, an assessment about whether something's pre- or postsynaptic, or whether some, uh, some adult brain can change or not under certain conditions, and so on. So, okay, so yeah, having sort of said all of that now, what questions do people have either about the final, the take-home part of the final, the what's going on for the next couple of days, anything like that that, that people are still unsure about, want to check in about. Sure, yeah. The take home portion is worth 60 points, and the in class is worth 90 points. Um, so you, have, you have two hours for each portion. Um, but the in-class is a little bit, it is actually more questions, um, and it's, um, but it's not, so the, the difference in the take-home is that I'm going to give you um, a new publication that you haven't seen before, and you may have to, and you only have to compare that to one or two other studies that we have already talked about. Um, and it's going to be similar methodologies um, with some, some alterations in the methodologies compared to what the other ones we've talked about, but, but sort of conceptually similar methodologies as, as what you've seen already. Yeah. Um, okay, and then, yeah, shameless plug, we've got shirts if anyone wants them still. Um, other questions about that? Okay, so for the... Um, for class today, I kind of want to do, I have two things that, that uh, two sort of topics to talk about, or two, two um, things to discuss. Um, the first is um, related to this motor control and neuroprosthetic stuff. Um, and again, even though that's not going to be on the final, since the final is coming up right tomorrow, and I, and, and I don't expect you to like learn a whole bunch of stuff and then be ready to, to do it like on a, in the context of all the other stuff and, that you've already got to manage right now, um, I did want to, um, to extend that a little bit and talk about one other set of issues um, that comes up with that. Um, and also, um, but even before I do that, I wanted to talk just a little bit about motor development and about um, motor control. Um, and so that's topic one, is sort of this unit stuff. Um, and, then, uh, and then the topic two for today, in the second half of class, um, I wanted to sort of um, take a step back even further and start to think about and discuss um, and sort of um, relate together some of the ideas that we've been discussing throughout the semester. Um, and the, the hope for that is that we can, um, it is um, partially to sort of get you thinking about things uh, and get you ready for the final, but also um, just to kind of like make an attempt at kind of tying together a lot of the ideas from throughout the semester. Um, okay. Um, but even before that, um, since the homework, uh, since I think a lot of you are still working on the homework, I wanted to do a, a, a quick recap of some of the stuff um, from yesterday uh, and, and see sort of where, uh, if anyone still has confusion or questions um, related to specifically the homework assignment that's due tomorrow. Um, so we've got this, these sets of recordings and these experiments done in the 1980s showed that if you have an animal moving its arm around and you're recording from neurons in its motor cortex, then those neurons don't seem to be so well correlated with firing of with, with um, con contraction of individual muscles, but instead their activity seems to relate more to what 
the animal's movement is. And so it's not whether the bicep muscle is contracting or the tricep muscle is contracting. Um, it's whether the animal is moving left or moving right. Um, and so these neurons seem to have sort of a preferred direction where they fire more when the animal is, in this case, moving left. They fire less when the animal is moving right. Um, and then for perpendicular movements to that, they don't really change, don't really care so much. Other neurons are rightward preferring or upward preferring or downward preferring. And collectively, among the thousands of neurons in motor cortex, you, will, um, you, you can move your arms around. And, um, and so um, if we're trying to figure out what sort of movements our, our, our goal with neuroprosthetics is to get a monkey to move a cursor, get a monkey to move an arm, or ultimately get a person to be able to move an arm and take care of themselves and have more autonomy than they otherwise do if they've lost the ability to move and control their own arm. Um, and there are three different um, um, ways that we can convert these motor cortex signals into a guess about what movement the, the subject is trying to make. Um, and the first, most complicated, um, is to use a Bayesian classifier. Um, and this takes into account, for all possible directions of movement, what is the probability of a particular neuronal response pattern for every possible direction of movement, um, and what is um, um, and, then, and then what are our prior no guesses about where the person might, or subject or whatever might want the arm to be moving. Um, and so, so we've got to know um, the probability of, um, of, a particular, um, uh, of a particular response. Um, and here response means the neural patterns in neuron A, B, C, D, on and on. For the hundred neurons that we're recording, we have the, some family of responses from all of those neurons. We want to know the probability of getting those responses given, um, given um, possible movement, possible movement A, and then the same thing for possible movement B and possible movement C. And so for every possible s pattern of neuronal responses, we need to know how likely it is that we're going to get that f um, for each of the possible movements. And so we end up needing to know a lot of information to make that work. Plus, we need to know the uh, initial probability of movement A and the initial probability of movement B. And then also the baseline probability of various neuronal set of neuronal responses. So that's a lot of things that we need to know, but if we know all of those things and spend the time doing, doing Bayes' theorem a um, hundred times for all of the possible movements, then we will get one, um, one movement that comes out, one movement X given our response family A, B, C, D, E, for all of our different neurons, we'll find something that has the most, that is the most likely guess. Um, and that is the best way to do it. Um, it is um, mathematically provable that this, that this is the best possible um, method for figuring out what a subject wants to do. But it has the downside that it is, um, as, as the number of neurons you're recording from grows, and as the number of possible movements that the subject might want the, the, um, the, the robotic arm to do grows, um, it gets incredibly slow. And it gets so slow that it can be, you, you, the last, the, like I said yesterday, the last thing you want is somebody wants to move their arm, and they have to wait 10 seconds for the computer to, fig, to, to process something, and then the arm moves an inch. And then they try to move it again, waits 10 seconds, the arm moves an inch. It's really, really annoying, and that would not be how you would want a robotic arm to be under your control. Um, and so the faster methods are to do vector-based methods. Um, and for the vector-based methods, um, all you need to know is the preferred direction for each neuron and that preferred direction is going to be the vector's direction um, 
um, you need to know the baseline firing rate for each neuron. And that's gonna, and then this is this is a constant for each neuron. Per, the baseline firing rate for each neuron, which is also constant for each neuron. And then at every moment in time. you need to know the actual firing rate. Again, for every neuron. And so that's going to be changing over time. So if I have 100 neurons that I'm recording from, I have 200 constants. One, uh, 100 constants is the, is the preferred direction of each. Uh, the next 100 constants is the baseline firing rate of each. Um, and then 100 variables, which is um, the instantaneous firing rate of each neuron. And then all I've got, if there's a neuron that has a preferred direction of right, then we're going to have some vector that at one point in time points right like this. At another point in time, the neuron slows down, points right like this. Maybe at another point in time, the neuron fires exactly at its baseline. And so, uh, and so remember again, length equals um, firing rate at time t minus firing rate the baseline for each neuron. And then at another point in time, maybe the neuron has slowed down, so the vector goes negative. Um, and so we can convert the instantaneous firing rate at any point in time into a vector. And it's going to be, this, for this one neuron, that vector is changing along one dimension. Um, different neurons have different firing rates, so their vectors will point in different directions. And at different points in time, those vectors will um, have different magnitudes and different contributions. Um, and so we can get, if we have enough neurons, some of the noise that's in the system can average out and we can get a reasonable estimate of where the animal wants to go. And so the first version of this is a population vector algorithm, population vector average. Um, a slightly better version, well, a slightly better version at first, if you have a monkey that you haven't given any training to, is what we call before the optimal linear estimator. And in that, we're going to account for some nonlinearities that we talked about last time, um, where a neuron might have a baseline firing rate of 3 hertz and a maximum firing rate of 15 hertz. So its vectors get really big when you're going in the preferred direction, but the vectors are really small when it's going in the unpreferred direction. And so that biases you um, toward movement. You get, you get good signal for one movement and not so good signals for the other. Um, but if you know those nonlinearities, then you can just multiply negative numbers by a constant and solve your problem. Um, in a little bit, we'll talk about one other adjustment that you might make with an optimal linear estimator um, that, uh, that can improve it as well. Uh, okay, so what questions do people have about any of that? Um, okay, so there's one other issue that you run into with an optimal linear estimator. And so to illustrate that, we're going to imagine three neurons. Neuron A, neuron B, and neuron C. And for now, we'll say that, that these neurons have solved the first issue. So we're not going to have any nonlinearities inherent in those neurons. So, for so let's just say they all have a baseline firing rate of 10 hertz. Neuron A's preferred direction is up. So it goes to 20 hertz, 15, 10, 10, 15, 5, 0, 5. So nice and linear, um, proportional to how much you want to go in that direction. Um, neuron B, same thing. Baseline firing rate is 10 hertz. Um, neuron B's preferred direction happens to be left. So it goes 20, 15, 15, 
10, 10, 5, 5, 0. And then for neuron C, um, keep it all symmetrical, same baseline firing rate of 10 hertz. But neuron C happens to have um, a preferred direction of down. 20 hertz here, 15, 15, 10, 10, uh, 5, 0, 5. So those are our three neurons. We don't have to worry about any, any sort of multiplication or division for pluses versus minuses because um, when you want to go this way, you, when you want to go in your preferred direction, you go up by 5, you go up by 10. You want to go away, you go down by 10. You want to go um, diagonally off, you go up by 5 or down by 5. Zero, zero change. Same thing here. So everything's nice and symmetrical with respect to the problem we discussed last class period. Um, however, we are going to run into some problems with this. And so what we're going to do, let me sort of close this off here. Um, so to, to, to see these problems, I want you to get together in groups and sort of work out um, what's going to happen if um, monkey wants to go up, up. Um, question two, the monkey wants the um, the the um, the cursor to go to go right. Question three: um, the monkey wants the cursor to go down right. And just for one more, uh, the monkey wants um, let's say upright. Uh, so that's part, uh, so let's first do that together as a group, maybe four or five minutes um, to try to work out. Um, okay, sounds like everything's all of a sudden gotten quiet, so it, hopefully at least people are done with the first couple, and, and we'll work through all of them as a group, and then you can, you can uh, see what we've got. So, um, so for question one, the question was, monkey wants to go up, um, so what is the firing rate in cell A going to be? What's at the top of that circle? 20 hertz. Baseline, 10 hertz. 20 minus 10 is 10. A's vector points up. Yeah, always up. In this case, up 10. So this is our vector for cell A. It's got a length of 10. Uh, animal wants to go up. B's firing rate is what? 10. Baseline is 10. So we've got a vector point, and B's vector always points to the left. So we have a vector pointing left with length zero. Um, and then cell C, um, firing rate for upward intended movement, zero. C's vector always points down, so we have a vector that points down with a length of negative 10, so like this. And then we add them together, and this plus this plus this, so we go up 10, then left 0, then down minus 10, and so we end up, we hit our target, going nice, good 20, 20 units of speed, good, life's, life's working out great. Um, second one, monkey wants to go right. Um, cell A, current firing rate, 10, um, so we've got, again, an upward vector with length 0, because 10 minus 10 is 0. Um, cell B, when the monkey wants to go to the right, firing rate is 0. So we have a leftward vector of length minus 10. Looks like that. Um, and then cell C gives us a downward vector with length 0. So we add those all together. We go up 0. Then we go... Um, left minus 10, then we go down 0, and so we still hit our target, maybe not going there as fast as we were um, in problem 1, but you know, things are still looking fine. Monkey wants to go down and to the right. Okay, so down and to the right, what is the firing rate of cell A? Down and to the right. Down and to the right. 5. Yeah, the firing rate is 5. The vector is, fi is 5 minus 10, which means we go up negative 5. So we get this. Cell B, 
If you're down and to the right, also firing rate of 5, what direction does cell B is vector point? Being, yeah, well, right, if you're being annoying, then you points left with negative 5, but that's fine with me if you also want to stay points right 5. Uh, anyway, that's what we get. Cell C. What happens with cell C? We get, uh, yeah, it starts at 10, we get to 15, so now our vector is downward pointing with a length of positive 5. Looks like this. So to add those together, we go start from our start, go down 5, then we go over 5, then we go down 5 more. Um, actually, it didn't quite draw that to scale. Down 5 more. And so our direction is this. Our intended direction was that. So we missed our target. 4. Similar sort of thing happens with 4. Um, vector A, uh, where we want to go upright. So we get this. B, we get a rightward vector of minus 5. So, or sorry, a leftward, leftward vector of minus 5. Um, like that. Um, and then cell C, we get a vector that points up with length minus 5, sorry, points down with length minus 5, so it goes like that. Um, and again, we end up missing our target. Um, so in this case, we go up 5, then over 5, then up 5 more. And so we go like this when our intended direction was like this. And so in both of these cases, in this case, we go too far down, and in this case, we went too far up. That makes sense? So that's sort of the mistake, right? Is we, is we sort of were more on the up-down than we should have been. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so, um, so I've got here a paper, and I'm not going to um, expect you to read through the whole thing. Let's see, do I have here? Um, there's this figure from this paper where they just imagine two neurons that are, have a separate, sort of separate, separated receptive fields from each other. Um, and in these two neurons, they tend sort of both to point right-ish. And so what that means is rightward movement's easy to encode, leftward movement's easy to encode, um, but up-down movement is not so easy to encode. It's sort of the, the ro a rotated version of what we just did. Um, and this paper, really, the main point of this paper, it's also where I got this other figure that I showed you before, um, where if you train an animal on a PVA, it can do a PVA. If you train it on an OLE, it can do an OLE. Um, if you switch it up on the animal, then it starts making mistakes. Um, so I'm just going to hand this out, just as, there's also up on black, Blackboard. Um, you may or may not want to reference it. You probably can do the next little bit without looking at the paper, um, but just because we have it, I'm going to hand it out. Um, so the next, um, the next question here is come up with two solutions to our problem. So our problem is that we are biased toward up-down movement. The reason we're biased toward up-down movement is because we have two cells that are giving us up-down information and only one cell that's giving us I suppose I should write like this. Only one cell that's giving us left-right information. So we have two cells that are giving us information about up-down. We get a, and so we're going to be biased toward up-down movements. We've undersampled the left-right. Um, and actually, one other thing that I'll note is even with 50 or 100 cells, it is quite often the case that you end up oversampling some directions and undersampling others. Um, so the, the, what we're going to be talking about now extends to these other cases. But in any case, right now, the question is try and come up with two different ways that we can solve this problem. Um, one of those ways should be a mathematical computational solution something that you can do to your computer program to fix the problem, and the other should be a biological or non-computational solution to this problem. Okay, so let's take 10 minutes or so to do that. You might want to ref read through the paper and look at some of the figures or not. It's Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think you think about the right, 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 yeah. So what kind of, yeah, I mean, does that help? To, 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 to what kind of, like, what kind of change would you do? So, um, I mean, what, you know, 
one way to think about it is like what would we want to do to our vectors, right? So if we change the length of some vectors but not others, which ones do we change the length of and how much, by what factor do we change the length? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or B double or either way, yeah, same thing, but yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. What's that? Oh well, you can just say you can just say I know I have X number of cells that are up down signaling cells and Y number that are left right signaling. And so I'm going to take all of my neurons that are up down and divide by or multiply by Y over X. So I mean, in this yeah. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely not. Well, you just put that in your computer. And then it'll, like, you just tell your computer, like, any of the cells, in my up, do I tell my computer cell A and C are up down preferring? Okay. They're, overly, they're, they're overly sampled. Right. When you get a vector from those, just cut it in half. Mm -hmm. And you're done. Yeah. Does that, it's, 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 I think you're kind of like trying to think harder about it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> How's it going? Okay. Okay, sure. So what's what needs to be done? So I mean, of course we need a program that will correct for bias in the neurons by somehow like weighting down the information given from the sure. biased yeah. neurons. That's great. That's yeah, I mean yeah, you're good with that. Yeah. And then the not yeah. Yeah. No, that's fine. Yeah. And how are you all doing? That's one option. Let's say that it's, let's say it's not on the table. So what else could you do then? Yeah. And what about the what about a non-computational solution? If we're not going to get more neurons, kind of really, well, yeah. I guess like. Kind of like um, what um, it re so we talked last time about when we had nonlinearities in the neurons, and then and then we had a magic wand that we waved that made the neurons linear. So, so how how would you, and how would you do that? Like, do you remember do you remember what what we did to make our magic wand happen last time? We no, we didn't change it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. How's it going? Pretty good. So you said like you would want to multiply like in that case. Yeah. 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 So in this you have yeah. So that's good. I see for biological solution you have sample more neurons. Let's say that's not an option that you're just stuck with these. And we talked about last time like oh we have this magic wand we can make our neurons linear. Do you remember what we did with our ma how, how we used our magic wand to make the neurons linear? You just put them in a linear program or whatever. And then made them linear. Ma how did I, I, I how did I make them linear? What did you just let the you let the monkey practice on a yeah, linear yeah. Like a program. And then and then it th and then it re it relinearizes neurons. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's sort of a more biological solution. Yeah. So um, in terms of the biological solution, we're not getting more neurons. Let's say is not an option. It's not an option to get more neurons. So, and think back about the magic wand we talked about last time, where we made our neurons that used to be nonlinear into linear th neurons. <laughs> this is your last class period. <laughs> So we made it, so last time we made our we made our neurons linear and we did that do you remember how so so I I drew up I was like oh wouldn't it be great if the baseline firing rate went up yeah. and this neuron became perfectly yeah. linear yeah. and then and then I was like and we can do that do you remember how we can do that just put it in the program and the animal yeah changes. just let the monkey practice with it yep okay that's okay. it Okay, sounds like most of the groups are, are pretty close to being done. Um, all right, so uh, question four over there, our part A, was a computational solution to this problem. So what can we do computationally that will solve this problem? Some reprogramming we do here. Sure, yeah. You can like, um, multiply 
multiply the underrepresented neuron or the underrepresented direction vector by two? Yeah. So so some groups said some groups said that take take um, neuron B's. Any vector you get off of neuron B, you just multiply by 2. Other people said, equivalently, you take any vector you get off neuron A and a vector off neuron C and uh, divide by 2 or multiply by a half or whatever. All totally equivalent. And you can work, if you do that, what you'll find, and you can work that out on your own if you'd like, is that here and here, we're going to get now two vectors of the same length, which is nice because the monkey gets to move the same speed, whether it wants to go up or left or right. Um, and then here and here, we're going to hit our target instead of missing our target. So that's a great computational solution. <coughs> um, what about a non-computational solution? Some people said collect more neurons. That would be great if we could. But let's say that we're not going to do another surgery on this, this, um, this poor monkey. It's sort of got with the neurons. These are the ones we've got to deal with. So what else can we do? To have to have this monkey um, to, to to solve this problem here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so get let the monkey get frustrated. Let it practice with our um, with our algorithm that weights all the neurons equally. And the monkey will make mistakes for a little while, but then it'll start to correct those mistakes. And if you go back in after that, and you look and see what's happened, what you'll observe is that after the monkey practices for a while, it will change the way it modulates the firing rate of its neurons. So, um, yeah. So after practice, it will modulate neuron A and B a little bit less. It will do exact oops, it will do the division for you that you wanted to do. Uh, that would be 7.5. 7.5, 5, 5 um, and then I've already forgotten this is uh, this is 15 uh, oops. 12.5, 12 12.5, 12.5, 12.5, 7.5, 5, 7.5. So it will start to modulate. It, 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 it makes A and C less responsive or, or, or less sort of um, changing from their baseline firing rate so that it has accomplished exactly what you would have done computationally. Um, and so if you're doing an OLE, this, this is another, so we talked about last time, one aspect of an OLE is to correct mathematically for the nonlinearities. Another aspect that you have to do to make an OLE work is this. Um, and then this is if you just use your simple PVA algorithm that doesn't make any assumptions and then you just let the monkey figure out the darn problem for you, then it'll do that. Yeah, you had a question? Yeah, so, so closed loop is practice. That's, that's just a fancy term for letting the monkey practice. Open loop means I'm going to record the monkey's activity, and then I'm going to go move the arm, but the monkey doesn't see the arm moving. So I'm recording from the monkey's brain. It's moving the arm, but I don't let the monkey see what the arm does. And so, and so closing the loop means you let the monkey see what, the, what our interpretation of what its, its neurons are. And so, it's, and so it closes the loop because the signal's coming out of its brain, getting decoded, and in an open loop it's getting decoded, and over there, in a closed loop, it, the, the information goes back into the monkey's brain via its eye, and so that's why we call it a closed loop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is right, but I think the other day on the graph that just showed, mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah, this wasn't actually over time. This was just with more if with more neurons. So if you're only recording from five neurons, um, then uh, then um, you get a noisy signal. And with um, with ten neurons, you get a little bit better. Twenty, forty, eighty, one hundred and sixty. The more neurons you get, the fewer errors you're going to make. Yeah, this isn't time. This is this is how many neurons you're recording from. So you get better you get better results with more neurons. Um, but for the same number of neurons. 
PVA sucks in open loop control, but it works just as well as the best mathematical solution you can come up with that's vector based um, for, for in, in, in closed loop control when the monkey's had a chance to adjust its neurons firing pattern. Yeah. What other questions do people have about that? Um, okay, so late, um, late last night I sent out a video to everybody, um, and we're not going to watch that right now, but the, in the video, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a video by Steve Chase, who's a, who's a prominent researcher who does brain-computer interface work here at Carnegie Mellon, um, and in that video, uh, he, um, he uh, starts off by saying that the hardest thing that you'll ever do is this. Um, and I think he's almost right about that. Um, I still think the hardest thing you're ever going to do is have a conversation with another human being. Um, comprehending language as fast as it comes in, that changing stimulation, um, and then putting out language um, with all of the motor commands that are necessary is incredibly hard. Um, but I don't think that he's far off. And in fact, something that might be on par with as hard as language might be hitting a baseball, where again, you have this rapidly changing stimulus, you need to make uh, adjustments very quickly um, and I'm by no means an athlete but if you th lob me a pitch I can usually kind of at least make contact with the bat um, and people who are and, and compared to like my two-year-old I am way the heck better at baseball than my two-year-old be proud of that fact um, <laughs> and so uh, and so um, compared to my two-year-old I'm freaking a great athlete. Um, and in the spectrum of like my two-year-old to a professional baseball player, I'm closer to the professional baseball player than I am to my two-year-old. Um, but I'm never going to be as good as a professional baseball player. And one way that we can measure the fact that it is that one of the hardest things you will ever do is make a relatively simple movement with a changing input that you have to make contact with is the fact that we will pay people who are not really all that better, but, but just a bit better than the average person at doing that millions of dollars for the sheer privilege of watching them swing a stick at a moving ball. Um, and it is amazing to us to see the precision with which they can do that. Um, and so that is one piece of evidence that indicates that these movements, that motor companions in general, are the hardest thing that you'll ever do. Um, in these sort of selfish, uh, uh, or whatever, um, these, this is my, five, he's now five, this is, in this video he's not five, this is when my kid was like two months old. And um, in, in one of the things that kids do, you're sort of wired to um, love making movements, especially as a kid, and the kids will just for like hours pick up a Cheerio and put it down somewhere else, or pick up a Cheerio and put it down somewhere else, or pick up a Cheerio and put it in their mouth, which is why you do it with Cheerios and not marbles. Um, but kids, um, kids just, your brain is like predetermined to love doing this activity. Um, and it is evolution's way of helping you learn how to do this. And so here, this is my baby, my now five-year-old when he was a couple months old, and he's trying to reach out and play with this line. And a couple times in here, you'll see, like, he, he seems to be kind of trying to reach, but instead of reaching with the arm that's close, he reaches with the other arm. Like, he can't even keep, he doesn't even know which arm is which yet. He's just, like, barely, barely able to move at all. And he's just figuring out, like, how his body moves. Um, and this is how all of us started out. And now we take for granted that if I ask you to raise your right hand, you can all do that effortlessly. Um, but it's an incredibly hard thing to do. And it takes years of training to get good at picking your arm up. Um, and so your brain has really tricked you into thinking that this is an easy task. But in fact, this is a really, really hard thing to do. Um, here's another, I just can't, you know, sort of again, shamelessly doing this, but he's kind of reaching for one thing. Again, you see the arm that is not close to the animal is the one that's moving a lot. And then he sort of like figures out and starts moving the other arm close to the animal and starts hitting it. Um, and you get the, you know, this big rush of dopamine, this big reward when you accomplish this task, or big frustration, as you can see there, he's about to start crying. Um, here, I'll skip that. This is him sort of rattling. Um, but one other, uh, one other um, in learning to crawl, he would 
he had sort of like had this idea that he's got to like get up on his hands and legs and start crawling. And so he would try to crawl towards something, but all he could accomplish was pushing with his arms. And so he would be like going backwards. And you, you see, he's going to start to he like is going to move away from this pacifier that he's trying to reach. Um, and so he's um, he's. Uh, so they're trying to reach this thing, and he finally like lunges for it. But at first, he's like crawling away from it, and the only movement he can make is to go backwards, um, which is again sort of kind of crazy to think that this is the way our bodies are are starting. Um, and then just one other that's kind of cool, and I know oh, this is oh, this is not what I thought it was, but okay. So he finally makes this and finally gets to the pacifier. Um, I thought this was going to be oh, the next one is. Um, one other thing that was interesting is like the, 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 the corrections that kids learn. So you, have, you make mistakes and you get feedback and corrections. And so the correction that he learned, this, this, um, this is the entrance to our kitchen here. This, this bar kind of, I guess, hurt his leg a little bit when he crawled over it. And so what he learned when, once he kind of figured out the crawling thing is to pick his knees up and sort of uh, walk on all fours without using his knees to get into the kitchen. Um, and so that's an example of motor feedback and using this motor, there's sensory feedback rather, just like our closed loop control, and then using that sensory feedback to change the way his motor system outputs commands. So there he goes, and yeah, and he just kind of picks himself up and <laughs> you stick his butt in the air like that uh, to get into the kitchen. So anyway. Um, so the point of all that being that, um, that this sort of motor feedback um, is, is uh, uh, sensory feedback is vital to learning. And also, it's a really, really hard thing that takes a lot of time to figure out how to learn, um, how, to, um, how to accomplish these sorts of tasks. OK. Um, so. Um, what, what questions do people have about either that stuff, the difficulty of motor, motor learning, or the sort of constrained motor learning problems that we've been discussing here? Um, okay, and so uh, for the last 20 minutes of the class or so, um, I want to... kind of just step back and remind you of some of the, the, um, the core themes and core units in the class and what we've been talking about. Um, so um, in the first unit of the class, we talked about how neurons fire action potentials, how they're electrically active. Um, and these, um, these neurons, as they fire action potentials, um, you, you've got all the sodium and potassium channels and all of that. Um, that are involved in the sequence of the action potentials in the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Um, but one thing that was sort of implicit in Unit 1, but we didn't really get to um, exactly, is that in the Hodgkin-Huxley mo models, there's a lot of probability of this being open, probability of that being open. Um, and that is one of the features that contributes to the fact that neurons are sort of sloppy at what they do. Um, a neuron is not as reliable as a transistor. Um, and people debate and wonder about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, I feel like I have a very rich sensory experience. Is that because I've got a bunch of sloppy neurons, or would I have an even better sensory experience if my neurons were more reliable? Um, so, you know, neurons are sort of um, sloppy encoders, and what I mean by that is if you give the same exact stimulus to a sensory neuron two times, one time you might get this pattern of responses, the next time you might get that pattern of responses. Um, there's maybe some common features that occur with some um, regularity across multiple uh, um, um, uh, demonstrations, and that's how we can perceive anything, right? If our neurons were complete noise, We'd never figure anything out. Um, but, um, but our neurons are not completely reliable. Um, and that also came back up in unit two. Um, and then, or sorry, in unit four. Uh, about information. Um, and then we also talked about um, how neurons communicate, um, synaptic transmission. Um, 
um, and how uh, synapses change, long-term potentiation. And actually, again, there was a little bit of probability going on in there. Um, part of, probably another part, not only are the sodium and potassium channels a little bit probabilistic in their behavior, but also um, if you have the same action potentials on the presynaptic cell, sometimes five of the points of contact will release neurotransmitter. Other times, two of the points of contact will release neurotransmitter because each one has some independent probability going on. Um, and so again, that, pro that may contribute to the sloppiness of, of transmission. Um, and nonetheless, we're sort of able to, um, to, to make sense of the world. Um, and then we talked about, um, I think the problem became even more amazing or more dramatic when we talked about kind of cognitive level processing um, in language, um, where not only are our sensors sort of sloppy, but also our, um, our stimuli are sloppy. There's, um, there's phonemes that change depending on the context, um, and yet we're able to make sense of it. Um, I don't think the only theme of this whole course is sloppiness. Um, there's a lot of reliability and a lot of um, really cool things that brains are able to accomplish. But one thing that amazes me is how much we're able to do given all the noise in our world and all the noise in our sensors. Um, and so we talked about language and language areas. And in that, we also talked about these sort of flow of information, so visual information going to the parietal lobe and then to the frontal lobe and then out to the motor cortex, um, auditory inf and, and as well going down here for object identification, object location, um, planning. And this is actually not a sloppiness thing. This is actually a reasonable organization. Maybe some of the connections are longer than they ultimately need to be. Um, but having this, um, this organization in the brain is entirely helpful. Um, auditory cortex also feeds into these ideas of object localization. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's a big open question. Actually, one big open question is um, where does it all come together, right? So when I um, see this object and it moves in the air, I have a perception of its location, I have a perception of its movement, I have predictions about where it's going to be, I connect that up with my arms, I make my arms catch it, it all kind of works out and I can catch the thing, usually on a good day. Um, but yet I also, I don't perceive a laser pointer somewhere in the universe and a moving thing like this, I perceive a moving laser pointer. And yet we know in my brain, the laser pointer identification is happening over here and the and the and the and the where and movement and how to interact with it is happening over here and yet i perceive those as constant so does that does there need to be somewhere in my brain that that can that that comes together kind of a big open question does this need to come together If so, where? Um, and then we also talked about more about visual auditory processing and also relating back to synaptic transmission and LTP, this reorganization. And then brought these ideas of um, of sensory processing and sensory organization into the realm of information theory and including Bayesian probabilities, prior knowledge and how prior knowledge affects our perception. And then in the last unit we talked about motor systems and again related that to, um, to reorganization and changes. So those are sort of some of the core themes from throughout the semester. Um, and for the next 10 minutes or so, um, there are three questions that I think are interesting um, to consider. Um, one is, how does this sloppiness relate 
to our awareness and experience. Um, question number two would be right over here. Um, does the location and object identification information need to come together? Does there need to be a single place in the brain where those things are processed simultaneously? Or can I, is it possible for me to perceive a laser pointer in this location when the location is in my parietal lobe and the laser pointer is in my temporal lobe? Um, and then the last question um, is, um, is how does the capacity for reorganization affect um, or relate to this awareness and experience. So each of those questions could be an entire semester. Um, for the next 10 minutes, um, i just like uh, the, uh, everyone to get into groups and pick one of those questions. Actually, we'll say seven minutes. Um, and just um, pick one of those questions and brainstorm some ideas. It doesn't matter which question, whichever one you think is most interesting. Brainstorm some ideas about that um, and then write that down on the paper. I'm just, this is really just, I'm curious to think, to hear at the end of this semester what your thoughts are about these sorts of questions that we've been only tangentially touching on. Yeah, just like little notes. Okay, so um, obviously these discussions can go on for, for a long time, but uh, I'm just curious. So a couple, I guess a couple groups pick number one. Um, so uh, let's say, so what, what did you all have to say? What did you all have to say? So does that make it like sort of a more makes more rich kind of? Yeah. Like, rich, very unique. You're yeah. Kind of, okay. You get different of different so uniqueness. Yeah. Cool. Okay. And then you also did what? What? What did you all talk about with that? Um, we said that like sloppiness and sensory input and like integration of information helps give us helps give us like a large field of knowledge and a very and a bit of a margin for this. Large field of knowledge, and sorry, what was the second thing? Um, um, like error? Large field of knowledge and like a margin of error. Margin of error. So we might miss some details or we might misinterpret some things, but we're a lot more able to synthesize things of thoughts and narratives and understand the world. Okay, cool. We don't have to perceive the world, but we'll be able to interact with that a lot more efficiently. Interesting. So, we have, so, so maybe, maybe our perceptions are a little perf imperfect, but that comes with an advantage of being able to. Um, to have, uh, again, sort of this richer capacity to interact with it, um, uh, so synthesize cohesive thoughts. Cool, great. Um, what about uh, you all did three, is that right? What, what did you all have to say about that? Okay. So in what, so impactful, what is that, like that it's gonna change your brain when you have experiences? Cool, yeah. So, um, and then what about back there? You all settle on question two after a little discussion? Um, we said that the information does not need to come together, but that usually it does. And uh, we, we thought that it comes together probably in the frontal lobe where the planning and movement happens. But like the simple laser point, you know what it is and where it is. Uh, and you don't want to 
react. So I would say in, in like the frontal lobe or in the spinal cord brainstem area, where like uh, it would come together to go to muscles, possibly. Um, and there's also those times where it doesn't always come together, and that would make like uh, where you see something but you don't necessarily know what it is or know where it is. Or mm, yeah, sort of a misperception. Information, and that's what makes yeah. perception fallible in the end. So you like you if you like. Uh, like if you see something and you don't know what it is, then you try to like compensate for what it is. You know what I'm yeah, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, that um, part of that kind of echoes um, uh, what uh, what in one of the videos I linked to before Daniel Wolpert's TED talk about movement. Um, uh, he's sort of movement centric and thinks that the purpose of all things that your brain does is to move is to help you with toward movement and your brain is really just using Bayes theorem over and over again to classify things and then make decisions about what kind of movements you need to make. So cool, yeah, thanks. That was, that was a fun discussion for me. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. Um, if anyone has questions or anything about upcoming stuff, do let me know. Turn in your group sheets on your way out and I will see you all at some point tomorrow for the exam.